So what we're going to do is uh, try to try to have a presentation about macro photography here. And uh, I have done a lot of these meeting type of things during my career with Big Blue and other companies. And they generally work out pretty well if two, th two conditions happen. One, there's not a lot of motion by the person who's doing the presentation. And number two, everybody doesn't try to chime in all at once. So I've never done a Zoom presentation and we're going to see how this works. Somebody mentioned the fact that the uh, um, presentations didn't work too well for, uh, for her on a spreadsheet or whatever it was. And some of my uh, presentation has to do with that. So without making any excuses, we're going to start off by doing a full screen. And I'm going to share my screen over here. And you should start seeing it now. OK, this is a macro. This is not the only type of macros that people can do. But this particular macro, I think, exemplifies what we're trying to do. We're trying to get really close up to our subject to see all of the detail and at the same time go through the subject from front to back. So hopefully everybody can see this. And uh, this is a dandelion that I pulled from my backyard. And we're going to go through the processes of how to create something like this. So I'm going to try to open up this presentation and see what happens next. Can we all see that? Somebody shake their head. Yes. OK. So I'm going to try not to do too much of this. We're going to have maybe 10 minutes of this, and then the rest of it will be demonstrations on a machine on what how to actually do it. So we're not going to try to bore you to death, OK? So macro photography is trying to get a close-up picture. And there's two things that you can do in macro photography. You can go out and buy a macro lens, go out and take a picture, and you've taken macro photography. But the problem is, is that's all you're going to ever do is see a little bit of the capabilities of your lens. What we're trying to do is combine art with an angular representation of the subject. So most of us are interested in flowers and nature and, and birds and, and small little details that we can pull out by using photography as our, as our tool. So what I'm going to try to do for you is show you what you can do with macro photography, the equipment that's required to get it done, some of the processes I use to do it, and then finally the demonstration. So this is a macro photography. This is a one-shot macro. And that means that I didn't take five or six shots. I took one shot using a 100 millimeter macro lens. You notice if you want, and I got to move the mouse really slow here because I found that there's a lag uh, with zoom. This is in focus. You can clearly see the vernier dial in focus. But if you look quickly in the background, everything fades out real fast. You look at this foreground, it's gone. And that's one shot using a macro lens at a close-up vernier. Now we look at this particular photo, and it's a little bit different. It's probably 15 shots that we've taken of various slices that are in focus and putting it together. I, I don't That's, think those are coming across. I, I'm not, I, I, am I the only one who's not seeing changes in? No, I don't see any changes either. Okay. You see the mouse moving. I. Yeah, I didn't see the mouse moving or any changes. Let's see if we got this. Don't Let me try this again on a different thing, see if. Still looking at the dandelion. Oh, you shouldn't be looking at the dandelion. There we go. Okay, are you looking? Are you seeing this? See the locks now. Okay. Yeah. These are verniers, and uh, let me let me back up just a little bit. These are verniers. Yeah, no worries. Okay. Okay. So what I'm showing you here is that this is a one-shot macro taken with a hundred millimeter lens. 
And this is in perfect focus. You can clearly see all of this. But as you go a little bit farther back, it starts blurring out. As you come forward of that, it's blurred out. The depth of focus is so small, so narrow, that we're talking about a focus length of one quarter of an inch or less when you were taking these pictures. Now, if we go to the second photo over here, this is, you should see a stopwatch on the screen. This is a little bit different. And here you can see from front to back, the focus is right spot on. Again, it was taken with a macro, except I have taken maybe 15 individual shots and moving my point of focus, like I'm moving my arrow here, up the watch. And then I use software to put this together. It gives you a better perspective in a more artful presentation of your photograph. Now, you don't have to wait till you have something. This is a dandelion shot outside. You can hand hold and do macro photography. It doesn't require 15 shots all the time. This particular one, I'm using my hands and nobody's seeing me. Uh, this one here was four shots taken with my macro lens. And I carefully moved the lens just a little bit each time as I was taking this. And I then put it together using the software. Now I'm a tech nut. This is counter bills. If I tried taking this picture with a regular macro lens, it would be totally blurred out. So what we're seeing here is maybe 12 different photographs, each individual one out of focus all the way, except for maybe a 10th of an inch. And then the computer puts it all together and we get what I consider a very good uh, photograph. But remember, I'm a techie now. And we're gonna go on. There's only a few more left. These are drill bits, very tiny drill bits. And you notice that the focus from front to rear is damn good. And again, the macro lens got me little slices of this all the way back through, and then I put it together. Now, technical is good, but you can also use it for flowers. And this particular flower was the same thing. I took maybe 12 shots putting this one together, and you start at the very front. No, I'm sorry. You start at the very back of flowers, and you move towards the front. And that's so that if there's any artifacts when it's put together, they kind of are hidden away in the system. Now we got two more photos that we're gonna do. This one is one of my favorite ones. It's just general bits. And it's really close up and I use a tele extender or, um, and, um, great, I forgot what the name of it is now. Um, so I added magnification to my lens. And from front to back, again, we're pretty darn close to focus. So when you do see a lot of technical advertisements or you see a lot of close-up shots on magazines and whatever, more than likely those are macros that somebody put together in the system. Now this is the last macro I'm gonna show you. And what this one is, is I learned a little bit from Stephanie Hazen and I picked up a bunch of other information. This is uh, another macro that I shot from this point here, if you see my mouse is below the line, and I shot up and through. This one here took 39 individual shots before I could assemble it. And there are some problems with getting that many shots and trying to put them together. If you look here in the background, this mirror has a little bit of a weird edge to it. That's called an artifact. And it also goes up into the flower. Under software control, you can get rid of that, but the general one is pretty. I mean, I'm sorry, I, I personally really like this one. It turned out really well. The mirror, everything turned out really nice. 
And if you look up front here, there's a slight artifact as well. So that's what we're going for when we're doing this macro photography. Some people like flowers, some people like the more technical stuff like I do. So that's where we are. Now let's go on to this next step and that's the equipment for macro photography. Obviously we need a specialized lens and that's what the one I've got is a hundred millimeter macro lens. I've seen it come in 50 millimeter, 100 millimeter and 150 millimeter. And to be honest with you, this is a 100 millimeter lens. It's not an L lens, which is a special lens in Canon. It's a normal 100 millimeter macro lens. Does the job for me without a problem. So you definitely need a macro lens. Some people think that they can invert the lens and there's, they have adapters where you can go backwards on a normal lens and it turns it into a macro lens. Um, I wouldn't try that very much. I, mean, I, I would stick with a regular macro lens. Extension tubes, that's the word I was looking for. Uh, I love extension tubes. And extension tubes are really great because they produce magnification. So they can take your 100 millimeter lens and magnifies the result. But it's also an inverse problem. The more you magnify, the smaller the focus point becomes. So if you had a quarter inch focus before and you put one tube on there, you may end up with an eighth inch focus. You put all three on there and it might be just a tenth of an inch or less focus point. But you get quality. I mean, believe me, it really magnifies, gets you close up to your subject. And an extension tube does not have any lens. So I showed you this by shoving a ruler through it. Now also, cheaper extension tubes do not pass the f-stops and the aperture settings through the tubes. You need a better set like a Kenco, which is metal. And you can see over here, there are pins that transfer the f information from the lens to the camera body. And that's really what you need. You need something like that. Lighting. Lighting is a bear. <clears throat> if you're outside, you got all the light you want. You got natural light. Or you know, you're taking some lamps outside. But inside, if you do a lot of macro like I do inside, you need lighting. Now I've tried, oh, I can't even tell you how many specialized halogen lights I bought, how many other things I bought. And it ends up that I have two favorites. These here are LEDs that you get from Harbor Freight for free. They just give them away. You just buy anything and they give you it away. These work great. The other thing that, I, oops, the other thing I use a lot is this L1. Now the L1 cost me about 30 bucks, but it produces so much light that you don't need another light. It bounces around all over the place. I can put a little reflector in the back and it's a very, very long lasting light. So I really enjoy this one. This one cost me about $30 from Harbor Freight. I've tried halogen lighting. And you know, one of the problems with halogen lighting, and I'm not sure you're aware of this, it wilts the flowers. So I have noticed that as I am taking pictures and I'm going through my 20 or 30 photos, all of a sudden I would see a big difference in the flower, the way it looked from the start to the finish. And it was because of the heat of the halogen lamp was wilting the flower. So. I woke up real fast and no more. So I am only on LED lights. And this particular one that I'm showing you here is, is absolutely my favorite. Okay, now we got that over with. We got another little trick that very few people understand. And then we're making small movements. What if you wanna do something outside and we wanna take a macro outside and not just a single macro, I'm talking about you know, four or five uh, different focus points. The key to putting them together is to make sure that you have uniform spacing. So the, how I gain uniform spacing is I have a rubber band that I put around my lens. 
And I don't know if somebody can see it. There's a yellow mark here that I painted uh, with latex paint. So this rubber band has even spacings. And I know that if I go outside at F8 and I'm at 320 ISO, that this spacing for each photo will be enough for me. And this is trial and error probably on yours. But now I know precisely that I can just turn my lens until I hit that particular next notch and bang, I've got the next one that I need. So when you take your macro photos, you really want to overlap slightly from one to the other. And it doesn't really take much. And this is like a freebie. It didn't cost me anything other than the little pencil marks that I, I made on this thing. Stable platforms. If you're inside taking macro photography, I really would advise you not to use a tripod that's tall. Your tripod should be short, stubby, and as close as possible to the ground when you're taking your, your photography. You're talking about tenths of an inch on your focus, and it doesn't take much movement or vibration for you to move out of that range. So what I have done is, I have done several things. I built myself this little tool here, which is, you can see almost nothing, but I can mount my tripod ball on this little screw over here. And then these screws allow me to lift and lower the bed. That's as stable as you can possibly get. It's very nice. This is a macro slide. Now they sell these things for several hundred dollars. Uh, I built this one. And this is another way to get stability. So I mounted a camera. This is my target over here. And I can rotate this very specific amount of turns to move my camera in and out to get the shots I want. And since I'm a super geek, I also have a stepper motor here that I have on my connected up to my computer. So I can move this camera back and forth with my uh, computers if I so desire. But OK. But this is my favorite. Rick and I built about five of these for members a couple years ago, two years ago, I think. I don't think anybody's ever used them. But all my macro photography I do inside the house is done with this particular tool. It's a very simple platform that I can move this tray at any angle I want. It's tightened by these knobs, and it's very simple to manufacture. And that's my absolute favorite. OK, now we talked about depth of focus before. We're getting pretty close to, um, I'm going to open it up for a little bit of a question before I go into my demo. But when we're talking about depth of focus, I made this tool also to help me understand depth of focus. And what it is, it's a 45 degree wedge. And I printed out this document that I built and put it on here. Now, if I look through the lens and do focus on some center point, which obviously I didn't do in this one very well, I think I actually hit it somewhere around the three. You can see that the focus point goes from this point here over to this point over here. And that's it. And, and we're talking less than nine centimeters, which is very, very, very small. It's less than a quarter of an inch as far as focus. So if I wanted to do this whole stretch from here to here, I have to overlap. I'm, again, I'm using my hands and you guys aren't saying this, I'm sorry. Uh, we have to overlap the shots as we go up and then back down again. OK, so that's the basic gist of what we're doing with macro photography. Now I'm going to turn it back on just for a little bit. And if there's any questions uh, before we go on to the next part of the demo. Yes, there are a few here that have been asked. Hang on, let me get back to it. <clears throat> um, let me get to the ones that have been written down, then I guess if anybody else has any others. Uh, John asked, um, are you using hardware to move the camera 
for each shot. And that ties into one with uh, Max asked, have you used a, a focus rail? And that's uh, you, uh, Max said, you uh, covered under the slide. Yeah, I, the focus rail I've used quite a bit and I use that under a special condition. It has to be a fairly large object in my world and the distance that I want to travel is fairly large, then I'll use that. Otherwise, I have programs, remote control programs that I'm gonna be showing you next that do all the motion automatically for you. So you don't have to do any of it. Does okay. that answer that question? Um, well, oh, is oh. It my eyesight or is this, I'm blurry, oh well. And Laura asked, what about white balance? That's a good point. I think any photographer knows that white balance should always be the first thing that you ever do before you even go out in the field. Uh, I mean, for a macro photography or any type of photography. I'm indoors. I have an LED light. So you want to, you don't have to do a light balance, but you want to take your first shot so that the computer knows what white and gray is. From that point, all the adjustments are made automatically by the camera. Does that answer that question? Hopefully. <laughs> okay. And uh, then I had a question myself. Uh, I was writing stuff down and I missed it. You had that light. Uh, you were, I think you called it an L light from Harbor Freight. Yes. Uh, what, what was the actual name of that? It's an L light? No, it's, it's called a magnetic slim bar folding rechargeable light. And I can tell you that one does answer my question. <laughs> okay. Uh, and however long you wanted to take some questions, I guess, because I think that's, oh, um, do you ever, okay, I guess Laura wanted to know about Boca and do you ever shoot topside? Do you ever use a snoop? No, never. Nope, 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 never. Not saying a snoot's bad, I just don't use them. If the snoot is focus light, then the answer is no. And how about bulky? Question, what? Do you ever try to get uh, bokeh? Or do you ever worry about getting rid of it or trying to keep any of it? Is that something you take into consideration? Okay, in macro photography, you don't want any bokeh, period. You're trying not to have any bokeh. That is the whole idea of macro photography. So we split it into two. When I first talked in the beginning, we talked about single shot macro photography. In that particular aspect, you can have all the bokeh you want, okay? That's cool. When you do the multiple photography where you're trying to get clarity, you want no bokeh. Now the total background past that point can be computer bokeh. You can put bokeh on it with the computer, but the whole idea is crisp, sharp, everything from front to back of your target. So bokeh is bad. Okay. That's all the questions that I have seen so far. All right. So what we're gonna to try to do now is I'm going to turn my camera on. And my camera is on. And I'm going to switch over to this one. Okay, that looks good to me. And I'm going to switch the program so you can all see this now. Share screen, that one, share. All right. So let me turn on the lights. Oh, there we go. Looks good, Paul. We got it on our screens anyway. Okay. Well, I had to turn the light on the back there. Okay. How do you get rid of this? Oh, that's how. Okay, good. Got rid of this. So what I did is I got a flower over here. 
And uh, you know what I'm going to do? Just give me a half a second. I'm going to miss it once. There we are. Okay, so I, I put some water on it. Now this is a really, this is a shot through the camera and I got a hundred millimeter lens on and I have one extension tube on it. Now this particular flower is very small. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to locate how much of this flower we want in focus. And you can see that right now, only this very, very little tiny part. Do you see a hand, by the way? Somebody say something? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so you see a hand with a plus under, right? Correct. Okay, good. So this right now is the only part of this flower that's in focus. But what I want to do is I want to go all the way back here. Now, there's a couple of different programs, and we'll talk about them later. The one that I recommend and my favorite that I've used for eons is Helicon Remote or Helicon Focus 7. And we'll, we'll talk about that at the end. Um, the remote control of Helicon, I just absolutely love. And it makes making these macro photographs, oh, an absolute easy thing to do. So. I've already pre-done this one, and I can tell you that this is the very, very tip of what's in focus. Now over here, this is our bracket that we're going to shoot. Now I'm going to hit the A, and you can see a lock symbol on there. So what that did is that locked in that position. Now I'm going to go back and move the camera. Can you see what's happening on the screen? As we're moving all the way back through, the focus is now changing from front to back. And we're on the leaves now, and I think this should be starting to come in now. And we don't wanna to go too much past that point, but we wanna make sure everything's in focus. So let's keep going a little bit more. Okay, now once you start seeing things go out, all we do is back up one. And then we're gonna lock this in. So now what we've got is the computer is telling us that at my aperture, which is right now F8, and by the way, on my particular lens, f 8 the sweet spot. I could do F11, but f 8 the sweet spot. So five, six to eight is, those are the two numbers that I would use for this. And it's gonna tell me that I'm gonna be taking 10 shots over here when I'm starting it off. And I've locked in my front, and I've locked in my rear. So now I'm going to go up here, and I'm gonna hit this start shooting. Now the computer will automatically, if you can see it going from here, move the camera lens, it's doing it all internally, to the position that I said was the first one. And now it's starting to take the pictures. So, okay, so that's the third picture being taken and you can see it's moving back and back and back. So it's gonna move automatically from front to back. And when it's all done, it's going to allow me to put the photographs together. Now there's two ways to put photographs together. I can play around with Photoshop. And yeah, that, that's not really an option for me. I mean, I'm a klutz. Putting together uh, four photos is a challenge for me. To put together 10 or 30 or 40 photos, that really is a difficult thing to do. And generally, the more extension tubes you put on, the more photos you have to take to get it all in focus. Okay, so right now you guys should also understand one thing. It took us a finite amount of time to get this thing done. 
Whoops. I hit my 30 minutes. Okay, Google. Cancel timer. Um, it took me a finite amount of time to do this. And uh, if you were outside trying to do this with wind, you'd never get it done. If you're trying to do it inside the house with rugrats running around, you probably won't get it done. Or even if my furnace fan comes on here in my shop, it moves enough that the final product will be spoiled. So you just got to pay attention to all that details. Okay, so the remote program did its job and it's now asking me if I want to go ahead and view the images in the focus. And I say yes. Now you guys are going to help me. Are we looking at helicon focus on the screen now? Anybody? Uh, we're still seeing the uh, just the image of the flower at the end of the shot that you took. Okay, uh, I, I will have to stop sharing and come back in again. Just yep. have patience. Take time. Stop sharing, share again, and we should be on this one now. It's going great, by the way, Paul. Good. Okay, yeah. so this should be Helicon Focus 7.6. This is a free trial, by the way, that I have. So the remote program automatically uploaded all of the images over here into the system. Now I can see that I screwed up a little bit because I got the CR2, which is the raw, along with the JPEGs. So I could click off all the JPEGs so that they're not inside the uh, final image, or I could just leave them in too, by the way. It doesn't really matter much. But let me do that just for clarity. So I get rid of all the JPEGs. Is that them all? Can I get rid of them? Yeah, look, no, I just want to miss one. There we go. Okay, so all of the JPEGs are, oh, there's another one snuck in. Okay, I'm clean now. All right. So the focus, Helicon Focus, has three different methods that it can use, which is on the right-hand side here, to render the final image. And we have method A, which is weighted average, depth math, and C is pyramid. Actually, I'm not gonna tell you that any one of these three is better than the others, because I use them all. I'll do it in one, then I look at it, I'll do it another, then I'll do it on another. Consistently, I like depth math the best. I leave radius and smoothing alone. I'm just gonna hit the rendering now. So the first thing that the program does is it's going to generate mask. And every single photograph taken in focus will produce a mask. And it's going to build this mask up inside of the computer. And I think I only took 10 shots on this one, so it really shouldn't take too long. The computer I'm working with is not exactly the slowest in the world, though. It has a lot of memory, and it's a fairly fast machine with a fast graphics card. So that helps a little bit on speed. But even a slow computer, no problem at all on doing this. And after all, <laughs> we can wait. Okay, now I think it's trying to build it up and bang, there it is. Now personally, I like that. That turned out really, really good. So yeah, I'm pretty impressed. You can see all the quality is there. You can see focus from front to back. You can see a lot of stuff over here. So then I can do a file, save. And these are all the images it took already before that. And I'm just gonna save that away for a future. And bang, I'm done. And to be honest with you, I like that. Now if you wanna do any cleanups, you could get rid of these water droplets I see over here, maybe, if you're interested in doing that. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing for a while. And are there any further questions about this process before we move on? Uh, yes, there uh, was, um, uh, was it? Madeline wanted to know, uh, how is the computer program communicating with the camera? Well, there's a USB cable that I attach between the computer and my camera. And it's the same, same cable I use to download images if I have to uh, off the camera. 
Now, I'm not sure that all cameras are able to be controlled by this particular program. I know Canon and Nikon can be controlled. I don't know about Sony. Rick spoke up to that and said that Sony could not, but he said that, uh, what did he say? He said, Helicon software does not work with Sony cameras, but the technique uh, Paul is teaching will absolutely work no matter what you are using. That is true. Um, and you can still use Helicon Focus itself to put together the images. You, okay. don't, you don't have to have the remote control, even though that makes life a lot easier for us Canon people and, <laughs> and uh, Nikon people. You can see how easy that was. I really had no problems at all putting the two points in, telling it to go, and getting the results. It was really easy. I did not see any other typed questions. However, I do have I this one for you. Have, oh, you sorry. have you ever used the tablet version of this? No. No, okay. Not because I, not because of that. It's, I just haven't. Okay. I've used it a bit and it is, for anyone wondering, it is super similar, uh, just interface wise, but other than that, it's super similar. Okay, who else had a question? I didn't see who it was. So Paul, I got a question sent to me from Scott. Uh, he was curious, what format is the output file? Is that a TIFF or? It can be, it can be one of three. It can be a TIFF or a JPEG or a DNG. Okay. How was that? I even knew the answer. Or at least you sounded like you knew the answer. <laughs> <laughs> that is dumb and nerves. <laughs> Okay, um, I'll close up the meeting very quickly. You heard my Google timer go off, so I know I'm about, I'm about done here. So let me get this one up and we'll go back to screen share. Oops, there we go, screen sharing. Ah, I gotta get this other one down because the screen sharing won't work. Okay, that's better. Let's try that again. I'm sorry, I'm trying. Okay, screen share. And back to here again. And this will be a quickie. So we're gonna do the demo, we did the demo. Macro software program to do these, put together macros. My favorite is Helicon Focus 7, it really is. It has the option for that remote control, which I demonstrated. There's a free 30 day trial, get it. Try it. If you got a Canon, if you got an Nikon, try it. I think you'll enjoy it. Okay. You can photo stack those images in Photoshop or equivalent. Um, it's manual. It can be done. I tried it once. I'll never try it again, but people have success. One thing you got to remember is as you're turning your lens and going through the focus, I don't know if anybody here noticed it, but the image size changed on you. So if you manually are putting this together in photos, Photoshop or whatever, Lightroom or whatever it is, you have to adjust the sizes as you go through the stack. It's really a pain in the uh, posterior. Okay, the other program that people use is Zerine Stacker. It works well, I have tried it, I really liked it. It also has a free 30 day trial. I do not know whether it supports Sony, but I think the two biggies in the field are the Silicon Focus 7 and the Zerine Stacker. Either one, you probably would, would love to have it. And I just really, really enjoy macros. They're fun. Uh, I'm always looking for an opportunity to kill my wife's flowers and bring them inside the house and you know do this. So I'm done. So. Any other questions? I've used the uh, Photoshop and used it with great success for this. Uh, what I find though is I need to align the images. You, uh, you select all the images I'm going to use and then align the images before I run the stacking. Yes. And that eliminates an awful lot of the headaches. It does. The newer version of Photoshop seems to do this better than the earlier versions of Photoshop. Did. I'm still at CS5, so I'm kind of backwards on that. I'm, 
but uh, you know, for fifty-five dollars or whatever the cost the photo of uh, Pelican Focus is, it does all the work for me. Let it let it let it work. Fifty-five dollars is pretty cheap for a license. Unfortunately, it's a yearly license too, by the way. But if you do a lot of macro photography, it's well worth the money. I believe me, it really is. Any other questions? Okay, Greg, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Okay. Paul, thank you very much. Uh, that was great. And uh, definitely an, an, an area that I haven't spent a lot of time in, and I, I want to do that. I don't have a um, uh, my own macro lens, and so I've got to look into whether or not I want to spend big dollars on that or if I want to. Uh, is there a, a kind of a price range that uh, these can be, or do they have to be super expensive? No, they're not super expensive, but you could also rent one from uh, your friendly photo supply store and try them out and see what you got. And uh, these 100 millimeter macros, a lot of people have them on sale because they buy them and they don't know what they do. And you can find them online pretty cheap for a reasonable price. And you were saying that a hundred or so uh, millimeter macro is what we're looking for. Is that? Yeah, I would think so. You you don't want to go any anywhere with that. Best hundred hundred's good. And the other problem you have is if you want the extension tubes, those are those will run you about a hundred to one hundred thirty five dollars if you're going to use the extension tubes, and those are a good buy. But after you get accustomed to using the normal ones. Then you can really bring in the magnification. Some people have done a lot of macro photography with microscopes, and that's a different field, but it's the same concept. Gotcha. Excellent. Uh, so one more shot with the, everybody that's out there. Any questions at all uh, for Paul? Yeah. Well, uh, Go ahead. I was wondering, Paul, you were using uh, 320 ISO on that. Is that what you would normally use? If if I were doing it, I would assume you would want to use as low an ISO as possible. Well, uh, I, hello. Paul's muted. Uh oh. You oh. went silent, Paul. There we go. Um, yes. 100 is really good. 320 on my camera, I don't get any noise. So I've got a Canon EOS 5 Mark III. Uh, I love it. I, I can go all the way up to, you know, 800 before I even start seeing any noise. So it's a trade-off between the amount of light you put into the subject and what you're going to get out of it. And with the LEDs, with the lighting I use, 320 is okay. Otherwise, your shots are longer, okay? Longer. Yeah, and you had an aperture of eight, I saw too. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I'd rather sacrifice a little bit on that, but you don't see it in the photos, I'll, I'll guarantee no, not you. Not the end product, obviously. No, you will not. There's more artifacts in there than noise, okay? So you won't see that problem. Okay, any other questions for Paul? No, we can no. workshops on how to build all that rigging. <laughs> it's cheap and yeah. easy, believe me. And, and some people can coerce me to do things too. <laughs> I'll have to talk <laughs> to your like wife about that, right? <laughs> yeah, well, when, when time is uh, appropriate, everybody's invited to the shop. I have, I love my shop. That's where I am almost all the time. Okay. So I'd like to thank you for listening, and I hope you picked up something out of the, this little lecture. Party at Paul shop. Can hey, I? Paul. Oh, do we have one more question there? Yeah. yeah. I have one. The LED lighting is blue. Yes. And I noticed that all the subjects you used had no warmth. Is there any way around that? Yes. Use the white card. Use the gray card, you get your image. Okay, because every, the lighting definitely made everything blue, but it wasn't true 
for shadows being cast because the shadows were being cast by a lighter grayish blue and you not also, by light, not you by also didn't you also didn't see what i had on the base can i just give me a second here i want to show you something okay because okay. i did this on purpose hold on Okay, so what I was shooting against is a slightly bluish clear piece of tile glass. I wanted the reflections of the blue on a blue image to come up. Right. So that's what I used it for. If I'm okay. going to shoot something that's a different color or whitish that I wanted to warm up, then I would put a different filter over this or I would post-process it to put a filter on it. No, we're not seeing what you're doing, but I can understand what you're saying. Okay. That's right. <laughs> your yellows in your orchid were not warm yellows. They had no... Yeah, this uh, isn't an orchid. Whoa, sorry. Whatever it was, the center, even though it was yellow, it was a cold yellow. And that was what really made me wonder about landscape or anything where you pick something out of it and did macro, would it always come through blue? Okay, I don't know if you can see this. No, we can't. Greg, can you put- like weird going on, all we see is Greg. Yeah, Greg, well, even on speaker mode. Yeah, can, if, maybe, Greg, if you mute and let Paul get into speaker mode. Get off our screen, Greg. Hey, there are worse things in life than seeing me full screen, okay? See that? <laughs> That's the original. That's a matter of opinion. <laughs> There's no difference between this and what the picture I took, except it oh, was wow. a little bit brighter. All right. Now we see Paul. Good job. Okay. Uh, okay. Paul, okay. Right. Paul, are you hey. able to reach that? one camera stand that you showed us the slide of the one that seemed to angle yes i got it right here could you move it around and show us how it works please oh i'm old you see this okay if i if i take this i can move it up and down which gives me an angle perspective on my shot into what I'm, what my subject is. When I get that's the right angle that I want, I just tighten it down and I'm done. That's great, thank you. Okay, and my camera's in there, so. Paul, is that something you made or purchased? It looks like it's got official writing on the side. Yeah, I made it, I designed it. Okay. Yeah, those are easy to make. Rick and I, we knocked out, what, five in an hour. They're, they're real easy. Easy for you. I have one, I'll sell you for $300. Well, thanks. <laughs> Put it on my tab, dear. Rick, Rick didn't opt for the deluxe version that I got. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice. Okay. Thank you, Paul. You're welcome. Yes, thank you, Paul. Um, so before we go, just uh, so everybody knows, we did record this meeting and we're going to be posting that. I will send out an email where that's going to land. I don't know yet if Meetup is going to allow us to throw it on the Meetup site or not, just because it's a video. Uh, we may create a, uh, a YouTube channel of our own that uh, we can go to and stuff. So. Uh, but as soon as we figure that out, we'll we'll be letting people know, and and hopefully we'll do the same thing with other Zoom meetings and stuff. So, uh, at that, I think I'll say uh, this was a good uh, first meeting, and I think it worked out pretty well. Hopefully, hopefully everybody enjoyed yeah. it, and uh, we will see you all around real soon. So, Thank you. good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank you did a great much. job, guys. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. All, all the work you put into oh. it. And Good night, guys. The financial support you gave the club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Great job.
Good night. Good night. Thank you, Paul. Well, I'll get get home safely, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I would call this a success. I've got an Uber coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't drink and drive. Ciao, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.